Hello and welcome to this undergraduate skills video where we are going to learn about various lab calculations which will be extremely useful as you progress through your degree. Now why do you need to know these calculations? Well it will allow you to safely determine the concentration of liquids in the lab whilst ensuring your experiments are at the correct concentrations. So without further ado, in this particular video we are going to focus on moles and calculations surrounding the mole. But first of all, what is a mole? Well, it is technically defined as a unit of measurement for various substances, and there are a few things to unpack here. As a unit of measurement, it functions in a similar way to some other more well-known units of measurement. So if I was to ask you how many units are in a pair, hopefully you would say the answer is two. What about a dozen? Again, hopefully you would say the answer is 12. So how many units are in a mole? Well this is a little more complex and that is because the mole refers to 602 sextillion, 214 quintillion, 76 quadrillion which is an extremely large and extremely precise number and because of this it is only used for certain applications primarily when we talk about extremely small entities such as atoms, molecules or compounds. Now the mole is quite unwieldy in its decimal format and therefore we generally write this using scientific notation or standard form becoming 6.022 times 10 to the power of 23 and if this doesn't make much sense to you please go and look at the short video on converting numbers between decimal and standard formats. Now this very precise value is known as Avogadro's constant and it is actually more than just a number. You see, Avogadro's constant is formally defined as the exact number of atoms in 12 grams of carbon-12 at standard pressure and temperature. And so one mole of carbon-12 will contain 6.022 times 10 to the power of 23 atoms of carbon-12. And you will have to admit that it is a lot easier to say one mole than the total number of atoms. And so Avogadro's constant is used to bridge the gap between the microscopic world of atoms and molecules and the macroscopic world of grams and moles. Now a key point to all of this is that regardless of whether we have one mole of carbon or one mole of hydrogen or even one mole of oxygen, they will each contain 6.022 times 10 to the power of 23 atoms. But what about if we were to combine carbon, hydrogen and oxygen to form glucose? Well one mole of glucose will also contain 6.022 times 10 to the power of 23 molecules. And so whilst one mole of something will always contain the same number of entities as something else, their weight will differ. Looking at the examples above, it should be obvious that one mole of carbon will weigh less than one mole of glucose. And so this is where we bring in something we call the molar mass. Now in plain and simple terms, the molar mass is the mass of one mole of that substance. And the interesting thing about the molar mass of a substance is that it is directly proportional to its relative atomic mass, which now begs the question, what is the relative atomic mass? Well, it is a dimensionless quantity represented on the periodic table of elements, with each element having its own unique value. Now the relationship between molar mass and the relative atomic mass enables us to determine the mass of any given number of moles for that substance. And so as an example, here we can see the periodic table entries for carbon, hydrogen and oxygen, complete with their atomic number in the top left corner, and more importantly their relative atomic mass in the bottom right corner. Now carbon has a relative atomic mass of 12.011. Hydrogen has a relative atomic mass of 1.008 and oxygen has a relative atomic mass of 15.999. Now these values will differ slightly depending on how you round these figures and so typically values of 12, 1 and 16 are used for these elements. Now in order to calculate our molar mass we take our relative atomic mass value and multiply this by 1 gram per mole. And so the molar mass of carbon is 12 grams per mole, the molar mass of hydrogen is 1 gram per mole and the molar mass of oxygen is 16 grams per mole. Now it is important to note that whilst the relative atomic mass is a constant value for a specific element, the molar mass may vary depending on the isotopic composition of the element. However, the molar mass on the periodic tables take into account the relative abundance of each isotope in nature and so we don't need to worry about this, at least not for now. 
Okay, so the molar mass is easy when it comes to atoms. We just take the atomic number and multiply it by one gram per mole. But what about molecules, as these aren't found on the periodic table? Well, a molecule is just the sum of its individual atoms, and therefore the molar mass of a molecule is just the sum of the corresponding molar masses. So if we bring up our glucose example from earlier, we can see that it has 6 carbon atoms, 12 hydrogen atoms and 6 oxygen atoms. And so to calculate our relative atomic mass for glucose, we multiply the relative atomic mass of each element by the number of atoms, giving us 6 times 12 grams per mole plus 12 times 1 gram per mole plus 6 times 16 grams per mole, which gives us a relative atomic mass for glucose as 180 grams per mole. Now hopefully from what we have talked about so far, you can see there is an interesting interplay between moles, molar mass and the mass of something, allowing us to create what we call an equation triangle. And this is where we can use two known values in order to determine a third that is unknown. And so in order to calculate the mass of something in grams, we would multiply the number of moles by its molar mass. If we wanted to calculate the number of moles, we would divide the mass by its molar mass. And finally, if we wanted to know the molar mass of something, we would divide the mass by the number of moles. And so we'll look at each of these calculations in turn using some specific examples. And in our first example, a student is told to weigh 45 grams of glucose into a beaker. And so the student wants to know how many moles of glucose are in that beaker. And so if we bring up our associated equation, we can see that the number of moles is equal to the mass in grams divided by the molar mass of glucose. And if we start adding in information from our question into our equation, it gives us moles is equal to 45 grams divided by the molar mass of glucose. And so to complete this equation, we need to determine the molar mass of glucose. So if we bring in our periodic table, we can use the relative atomic mass of each component to calculate our molar mass. And so 6 times 12 grams per mole plus 12 times 1 gram per mole plus 6 times 16 grams per mole gives us a molar mass of 180 grams per mole, which can now be substituted into our equation, giving us the number of moles being equal to 45 grams divided by 180 grams per mole, which we can now solve to give us an answer of 0.25 moles of glucose in the beaker. Now moving on to our second example, a student is in the lab and needs 2.5 moles of sodium hydroxide for an experiment. And so the student wants to know how much sodium hydroxide do they need to weigh out. And so if we bring up our associated equation, we can see that mass in grams is equal to the number of moles multiplied by the molar mass of sodium hydroxide. So now we can start adding in information from our question to the equation, giving us a mass is equal to 2.5 moles multiplied by the molar mass of sodium hydroxide. And so to complete this equation, we need to determine the molar mass of sodium hydroxide. So if we bring in our periodic table, we can use the relative atomic mass of each component to calculate our molar mass. And so 23 grams per mole plus 16 grams per mole plus 1 gram per mole gives us a molar mass of 40 grams per mole, which can now be substituted into our equation, giving us mass is equal to 2.5 moles multiplied by 40 grams per mole, which we can now solve to give us an answer of 100 grams. And this is the amount the student will need to weigh for their experiment. Now moving on to our third and final example, which is a lot less common in practice, and this is where we need to find the molar mass of a substance. So here a student is told they have 0.6 kilograms of substance X in a beaker, which equates to 1.25 moles. And the student wants to know what is the molar mass of the substance. And so if we bring up our associated equation, we can see the molar mass is equal to the mass in grams divided by the number of moles. So now we can start adding information from our question into the equation, giving us the molar mass is equal to 0.6 kilograms divided by 1.25 moles. Now we can't actually solve this equation yet because it is incorrect. And that is because when calculating the molar mass, which is in grams per mole, the mass also needs to be in grams. And so we need to convert our 0.6 kilograms into grams, 
giving us the molar mass being equal to 600 grams divided by 1.25 moles, which we can now solve to give us an answer of 480 grams per mole, which is the molar mass of substance X. Now, as I said earlier, this is a much less common scenario, as more often than not, we deal with known compounds, allowing us to calculate the molar mass from the periodic table but it is always worth knowing the different equations that come from our equation triangle. And with that, we come to the end of this basic laboratory calculations video. Hopefully you found this content useful, easy to understand, and can use it going forward during your data analysis. Thanks for watching, stay safe, and I hope you have a great day.